Happy holidays, friends. We've got an amazing lineup of uh, some of the best of 2018 coming up over the next few weeks. And the best way to make sure you don't miss any of that is to subscribe to the show, which you can do at comingupnext.com.au. You'll find links to iTunes, Stitcher, Podbean, Spotify, whichever platform you consume podcasts through. It's going to streamline your listening experience and make sure you never miss an ep of Coming Up Next. Merry Christmas, my friends, a belated happy Hanukkah and a happy holidays in general. I hope your 2018 is wrapping up smoothly and uh, looking forward to uh, an amazing 2019 ahead. Um, kind of like throwing up a lot of ideas about how we can evolve coming up next uh, in the next year, in the next calendar year. It's kind of a bit weird to because we started the show in the middle of the year, so it's kind of like half a year of progress, I suppose. But anyway, three and a half years in. And uh, I think 2018 has been an incredible year. There's been a lot of amazing guests come on the show, people people who I never really even considered or, or thought that I would get to have the chance to have a conversation with. And uh, as is tradition at this time of year, we're looking back over the year that has been. Um, if you go back right to the f- sort of first half year in uh, 2015 when we started the show um, was doing a little bit like sort of clippy show things clippy shows doing clip shows Uh and I felt like it was probably a little bit more well I wanted to um, present you know some of the highlight episodes a kind of curated uh, list we did it last year I think we may have even done it two years ago as well Um, so over the next few weeks uh, we'll be bringing you some of my highlight episodes of 2018, starting this week with uh, with legendary filmmaker Philip Noyce. But before we do, just wanted to say a big thank you to my guest from last week, Sam Bash, who is a Grammy Award winning musician, producer, player, you name it, he does it. Um, it's a really insightful interview about uh, what the kind of status quo is for musicians, for songwriters, kind of specifically in the uh, in the age of streaming. So you can check it out if you haven't listened to it at comingupnext.com.au where you can also find links to subscribe the show, subscribe the show, just subscribe to the show. And, you know, while you're doing the subscription, you can also, if you're feeling in a festive mood, leave a rating and a review of the show. Uh, I know it seems kind of ambiguous and like a weird thing to do, um, but it really helps to kind of keep you know, the algorithms flowing, it really helps to keep uh, the show visible. And uh, and that helps me to bring you more amazing guests. Uh, And on that note, let's, uh, let's roll into the first of my 2018 retrospective with legendary filmmaker Philip Noyce. Philip, you may know as the uh, the director of The Quiet American, uh, The Bone Collector, Rabbit Proof Fence, his list of credits is insane. So when he asked uh, me to come to his apartment in Sydney while he was in Melbourne about this time last year, um, I jumped at the opportunity. I know I said it's a 2018 retrospective, and it is, because this episode was released in February of this year. So please kick back, uh, pop open some of that festive cheer I have heard so much about, and uh, enjoy the 2018 retrospective, episode 178, I guess we'll call this, of coming up next, the podcast with Philip Noyce. Congratulations on the Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, was that, that was presented to you last week. Yes. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, you look back over your career it's, and it's just remarkable to see and to kind of track what you've done. Um, and you grew up here in, uh, in Sydney? No, I grew up in Griffith uh, until I was 12 um, in the Murrumbidgee Irrigation Area, about 400 miles southwest of Sydney. Um, then just as I was uh, about to enter high school, we, the family moved to, to Sydney 
to Hornsby on the outskirts of Sydney. Right. Was that was that quite a culture shock for you as a young man? Uh, not really. I mean, we'd been to Sydney every Christmas holidays. Uh, my grandparents lived in Burwood, uh, where my grandfather was uh, a Church of England pastor. Uh, so I'd spent a lot of time in Sydney, and we always came to the city from the country for uh, the Christmas holidays and to get away from the heat. Mm. Yeah, right. And so when was it that you kind of started dabbling in the creative arts and and that kind of world? Well, uh, when I was at high school at a private school uh, on the outskirts of Sydney Barker College, School for Boys, it's now co-educational, in about second form, 14 years old, I uh, started to get an interest in adapting um, books to play, um, which a group of us did uh, with uh, pretty disastrous results. You know, we'd get <laughs> booed off the stage, um, but <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> we kept trying. Yeah. Um, and also, uh, we started an, a newspaper, which was published every month. Right. They were the first dabblings yeah right although mainly i played football and uh and cricket right <laughs> was it was it was it something about that kind of maybe not in a like strictly artistic sense but that kind of commun- communal collaborative sort of effort to achieve something well i think it uh, um as often happens it was just having the right mentors at the right time i mean everything that's happened to me in the movie business or creative uh, endeavors has been uh, as a result of an inspiration that's been provided by someone else. We had a uh, particular teacher at that school. He'd come from South Africa as a refugee of sorts, and uh, he uh, organized a, th- a theater group, um, which I gravitated to, and then sort of branched out and, and did it myself. Um, then in my final year at high school, in the Holidays towards the end of the year, September holidays, I was wandering through Glebe in the inner city and I came across this um, telegraph pole with a psychedelic image on it uh, <laughs> and the words American Underground Films. Yeah, well, the word underground was enough to super excite me. <laughs> um, they were playing at the Union Theatre, the, now the Footbridge Theatre, on Parramatta Road at Sydney University the next Sunday. So I headed into the, back into the city the following Sunday and had my mind blown by about 12 or 13 short films, uh, mostly from America, what were then called underground movies, but uh, three or four films from Australia, one called Boobs A Lot by Aggie <laughs> Reed, which was... Um, simple uh, stop-motion animation of uh, shots of uh, female breasts taken from Playboy magazine and other magazines. A film by Aggie Reed, uh, not by Albie Toms, and a film by a guy called David Perry. Anyway, after the screening, I mean, these these films were not an industrialised entertainment commodity, but, but um, rather like uh, uh, works of art. Um, they were about self-expression. They were made for nothing. Uh, there was a couple of animated films that used uh, direct animation, that is, draw- drawing directly onto film stock and then colouring in um, the scratches. And um, not only w- were they exciting for what for how they used film. I mean, one of them I can remember was uh, Bruce Connor's film Report, which took the Sabruda. Sabruta uh, footage of uh, John F. Kennedy's assassination and reworked it. Um, another one by the same uh, filmmaker was Cosmic Ray. And I'd never seen editing, I'd never seen, I'd never experienced this kind of approach to what was called a movie. As I said, three of the films were made in Australia and afterwards the three guys that made them gathered in the foyer and I gravitated towards them. I saw they each had a beard, 
Uh, they told me they <laughs> they lived in inner city houses and uh, they they were film directors. I thought, wow, well, I, <laughs> I can grow a beard. I'm 18. I started to grow one immediately, <laughs> never took it off. And their motto was anyone can make a movie. So next Christmas, that's the Christmas after I uh, left high school, I worked for six weeks, saved some money, and then sold parts to my friends. The more money they gave me, the bigger the part they got. Oh, you mean like a role in the film? A role in the movie, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. So the movie was about the sex fantasies of a teenager, right. and for 400 bucks you could have the whole, uh, the whole fantasy. Um, <laughs> I, the guy that came up with 400 uh, was a doctor's son from Rose Bay right. named David Frost, no relation to David <laughs> Frost, the English uh, TV commentator and compare. Um, but uh, David uh, had 400 bucks. He got the lead role, but he was a hopeless actor. Was, um, was, it, was it his first time? It was his first time, my first time. I paid $25 a day to David Perry to come and photograph it on his uh, wind-up Bolex, and I hired uh, Clemency Waite, who had starred in a couple of Albie Toms' shorts, to be the naked woman that was the subject of his fantasy. Right. Um, and a month later, I, too, was a film director. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> that's what I've been ever since. So how significant is it, in your opinion, to have a beard to be a film director? Well, it's worked. <laughs> uh, I, I guess on a serious note, you know, is you're telling the story of a, uh, a teenage boy uh, and his, I guess, unfulfilled sexual fantasy, which I can only assume was just based on your own kind of ideas and fantasies at the time. I wouldn't say that. It was... Um it was an attempt to use all of the tricks that I'd seen in the, in those 14 so-called underground movies. Mm. I tried to fit in there a little bit of everything, right? which I guess is what every artist does. You know, you're always influenced by, um, by what's come before. Well, for me, in short films, there are only 14 of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think I copied... Uh, a, a, a trick from each one um, into my first first film, right. which um, also came out at a time of great change in Australia. Um, the Liberal Country Party were in office. Yeah, Don Chip was the minister for whatever. I forget what he was minister of, but he was the guy that changed the censorship laws. Um, but at the time, Australia was highly censored. I mean, it was almost like Ireland. I mm. mean, you know, they regularly would seize Playboy magazines at the airport and make a big show of it, <laughs> as if it was, as if it was, uh, you know, contraband. Uh, contraband. Um, so, was this like the late sixties? Late sixties, but things were sudden were changing. Yeah. Um, but when I when my film came out, I sent it to a uh, film festival in. Um, when I finally finished, I sent it to a film festival in Holland. At the time, in order to import films, you had to go through the Commonwealth Censor. In order to export films, you had to go through the Commonwealth Censor, believe it or not. Right. So if you posted a film, they would seize it and send it off to the censor. Well, I was lucky because my film got seized, <laughs> got sent to the censor. It was banned, but it was only banned from being exported. I could still screen it anywhere in Australia, but then it was up to the cops or somebody to complain to the cops the cops to observe that it was pornographic and then and then take action so i had a banned film that could be freely shown until somebody decided that they wanted to complain so it actually <laughs> taught me a lot about uh, you know commerciality because that film really paid for my university yeah, right. not that it cost anything at that time because another one of the good lurks of growing up in the lucky country at, at that time was that tertiary education was free. In fact, they paid you to go yeah, right. to university. But um, we digress. Th things started to change. You know, uh, Philip Adams, still alive, Barry Jones, former uh, quiz kid uh, on, a, on a show called The Quiz Kids. Oh, actually, it was, or was it Pickerbox? No, it was Pickerbox. 
Barry Jones then became a Labor MP. Together with Philip Adams, they convinced John Gorton that uh, he would um, achieve immortality if he sponsored a, uh, a system of support for the Australian film industry modelled on the Eastern European socialist model that had been set up in um, Czechoslovakia, now the Czech Republic, and, uh, and Poland very successfully. Of course, they were both semi or mostly communist countries. But the government here in Australia decided to kickstart a film industry. They bought an experimental film fund, which took kids like me and gave them small amounts of money. They bought in a film school, which took kids like me and sent them to film school. And then they had a uh, film finance corporation, which was like a commercial bank, which loaned money for feature films, which when I was no longer a kid, but had made some shorts, gone to film school, and five years after that, the Australian Film Finance Corporation uh, and the New South Wales, newly instigated New South Wales Film Corporation invested in Newsfront, a film that was uh, being produced by David Elphick, uh, cost 505000 and that was my first big feature. Yeah, wow. So I'm really a poster child of, um, of the Australian government's film intervention. So I guess to... Uh to hook back a second into or step back a second you so after you've made this short film you went to film school you went to afters in yeah uh, first year of afters okay 1973 to 74 one year course right they imported professor jersey toplitz from poland who had run the uh wotes film school and had taught uh, amongst others waja and uh Polanski, Skolomowski, and uh, it was just a one-year course for 12 students. They paid us $110 a week to go to film school. It's crazy that they paid you. They paid us. <laughs> um, now you get tens of thousands of dollars of debt. Because they said, uh, you know, we want mature, mature people to be able to go to the film school and we want them to be able to afford to go. It was a one-year course they gave it. We had to make three films, a drama, a documentary, and then any, any film that you wanted to make. So you had three budgets. First budget was, I believe, 2000 The second one was like 2500 And the third was like $3,500. So they gave you money to make the film. They gave you well. the money. Now, you could do whatever you like with the money, but you had to use professionals in every capacity. Actors, you could write it and direct it, you could star in it, and you could do anything that you could prove to them, to the film school, that you could do to a professional level. Otherwise, you had to manage your budget and go out and hire a cinematographer, a first assistant, an editor, everyone, actors. Yeah. You had to, so, in other words, you had to go through the whole process from scripting through to finishing your movie and managing your money, and then you 100% owned it and could exploit it. Wow. I mean, that's an incredible model. It's a perfect model. Yeah. I mean, you come out of film school now and just got no idea what to do in the real world. Exactly. So we were forced into the real world immediately. Yeah. You know, and we were forced to make relationships, which is what filmmaking is all about. So you had to go out and find a cinematographer. Okay. I ended up with, uh, my first film was called Caravan Park. I ended up with Tom Cowan, who's a beautiful uh, uh, operator and, and lighting cameraman. Um, had made a number of uh, features, The Office Picnic being one of them. Had to hire uh, an editor. I had Tony Buckley, actually. Tony Buckley, who had uh, been, uh, up to that time, Australia's premier editor, He's responsible for that extraordinary uh, montage in Wake in Fright, Ted Kotcheff's film, and Tony had ed edited Wake in Fright. Actors, you know, we went out and, and had to engage with the cast, with casting people and, and fine actors. Uh, and then we could screen the movies. Well, I'd already grown up in the Sydney Filmmakers Co-op and... and uh, 
we'd worked the system to screen our films in non-licensed cinemas. So, you know, at the end of that year, I had three films. I put them on at the uh, back at the Footbridge Theatre where I'd first, you know, been inspired to make movies. And I had made a film uh, about a biker and a hippie. It was called Castor and Pollux. It was a documentary. Uh, it became notorious because of some of the sequences that I'd shot with this biker gang called The Finks. And I hired that Union Theatre for about $80 a session. I charged $2.50, had 10 sessions, and, no, and the 600 seats were sold out every time. Mm. So, I mean, in the one year I had a complete, complete um, uh, uh, schooling in f Film 101 from concept through to uh, you know recovery of money well it was all ours we didn't have to pay the film school back later right. on they decided that they wanted to own the movies right which I think was a big mistake because you need you know every student who's making their film school film needs to feel that that is not just their entree card but their living because every film is your living you know and I don't know why they changed that it was that was silly so I guess, you know, uh, not only are you having this great kind of practical experience uh, as a filmmaker, as a director, you know, you're also afforded this amazing networking opportunity. And I assume you're kind of, well, uh, maybe I should ask, are you given the resources to go and find these people or is it kind of a lot of cold calling? And then does it kind of set you up with a network of people beyond your film school yes, years? Yes, it did, both. I mean, you had to go out and find people. If you couldn't find them... There were uh, employees of the film school on hand to suggest people, but yeah, I mean, it was it was all about networking. And it sounds like you're you were learning at a young age to create work that was going to kind of push the envelope a little bit. Not push the envelope, but be viable. Be viable, okay. You were learning. I mean, you know, there we are, 1973. You know, you're going to film school. We you've got three three chances there to make movies that maybe can take you to the next level. So how did you find that you were able to go from that to making something like Newsfront? Well, uh, again, you know, uh, it was not just, um, it was not talent and it wasn't, it, uh, it was all about opportunity. And at that time, as now, there was uh, cradle to grave government support uh, for the arts. It had been uh, increased by the Whitlam Labor government that came in in December 1972, actually just about now, this being December. Whitlam had come in, he'd expanded the work of the two previous prime ministers and uh, increased funding to the arts uh, which now extended through all aspects of Australian society, through the Australian Council for the Arts, extensive uh, support for uh, theatre groups and community groups, poets, painters, writers, you know, a very extensive uh, a model. And with the film industry, they in they'd introduced an in-between stage so for those people who are uh, graduating from the Experimental Film Fund first shorts but were not yet ready to make a feature, they had this, um, this other in-between, I forget what it was called, but basically it gave up to 20, 25,000 for longer short films. And I made a film called, I applied and got 25,000 to make a film called Backroads, which ran 60 minutes if you ran it at 25 frames a second, but <laughs> it was a feature film because it ran 61 minutes if you ran it at 24 <laughs> frames a second. Um, and so it ended up as a feature film with uh, David Stratton premiering it at the Sydney Film Festival. And uh, then it ran at the Longford Cinema, which was a cinema supported by the Australian Film Institute down in Melbourne. And we even sold it internationally. Uh, it went to um, to the 
to the Scala Cinema, which was an independent uh, cinema in London, and ran there for about nine weeks. What was the what was the process of making that film like for you? I guess now in reflection. Well, you know, it was it was a dream. It is based on a on a short story by um, John Emery, a South Australian writer. I'd adapted his short story Caravan Park as my first project at the film school, and now uh, together with him, I adapted uh, another short story, and then cast it. Basically, it was the story of um, a black man and a white man who meet up in the outback, steal a car, and travel across country towards the coast, picking up people as they go, and eventually it ends up in in tragedy. Um, But um, a lot of the film was improvised by the two lead actors, Billy Hunter and and, and Gary Foley. But, you know, it was a dream in as much as... uh, there was complete freedom to do what you wanted. That was what we had, what we grew up with in Australia. You know, not like say the Hollywood model, where you where you're making films that have to feed into a system that's been uh, that's a road that uh, a tight rope or or, or a um, gauntlet that you have to run that has its advantages, which is that, you know, Hollywood sells the movies all around the world. We were still establishing how we were going to sell our movies in Australia. So there weren't any rules, really. Mm. And you weren't running a gauntlet at all because... um, um, You weren't really answering to anyone. Yeah, you weren't answering to anyone but yourself. But, But in... I mean, the film was relatively successful, but it was also sort of a failure in a sense and like every film that you that i've made ever sit from then to now you know it was a a giant learning experience right what was the was there a particular part of the filmmaking process that really gave you a buzz that you you really enjoyed sort of i guess over all the uh, any other parts i was interested at that time and at film school in exploring Australian Argo, the Australian uh, accent and language and the individuality of the language. We did have uh, drama in Australia, but not much. It was on television, mainly on the ABC, and it was not realistic in as much as the actors spoke this weird this weird Australian English, which was more English than Australian. Yeah, right. Um, so there wasn't like a fair represent or an accurate wasn't, representation. wasn't an accurate representation of how we spoke. Yeah. Um, Why do you, do you think that's because of that's but what was in? I, in a way, I, 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 uh, I extended the, the experiment too far in that film because uh, I certainly captured the Australian accent but it was often uh, grating for the audience. You know, the profanity um, and and just, I mean, I, I, I chose two actors that had particular uh, um, vocal characteristics. Um, I used the same actor in my next film, Newsfront, uh, Bill Hunter, mm. um, but, but with a much more disciplined screenplay. Did you find that the process of making Newsfront was significantly more, I guess, streamlined than... Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Newsfront uh, was... Uh, Backroads was from a, like, 20-page script for a 60-minute film, so... 61 minutes. 61 minutes, yeah. <laughs> so usually, uh, you know, it's like a, a minute a page. So it was... A third of it was scripted and two-thirds of it were improvised um, whereas Newsfront was the opposite it was a 200 page script that ended up as a 110 page 110 minute film of which 12 minutes was newsreel footage so right. we only shot 100 minutes yeah um, so yeah it was it was uh, very disciplined it was uh, you know a $505,000 movie uh, which took me to a completely different level 
because there we were back recreating Australia as it was in the years 1948 to 1956. I was lucky to be handed the gift of what essentially was quite a radical idea pre Woody Allen Zellick. You know, the idea uh, developed by David Elphick was to take newsreel footage, um, which was appropriate to this drama about the story of two newsreel companies operating in Australia before television, and to use the newsreel footage within the f and blended with the fictionalized story. So the characters stepped into the newsreels that they might have shot at the time. Um, so the film opens, for example, with the arrival of uh, a migrant ship to Australia that's been covered by two newsreel companies and 75% of the sequence is newsreel footage shot at the time um, and so on throughout the movie. So that was a radical idea. I was really lucky to be the director of that movie um, because it gained a lot of uh, um, uh, attention all around the world. And in Australia, with the brilliant campaign from uh, Roadshow and Village from Village Roadshow, you know, it was a, it was a financial success. The interesting thing about that era of uh, the uh, early, well, the seventies really, uh, which was the first years of the new wave. Interesting thing was that the audience um, was so hungry, the Australian audience, to see themselves. They were like babies looking in the mirror, just fascinated with their own image because it was an image and a sound that they had not ex otherwise experienced. Particularly given the fact that uh, so many of the films were set in the past. So it was like Caddy, like Picnic and Hanging Rock, uh, like The Getting of Wisdom. They were uh, films about Australian, or it was, you know, about what it, that define what it was like to be an Australian and turned a microscope on our past. So we're looking back and the audience couldn't get enough of it. I mean, we could make the films for between two and five hundred thousand dollars and they were time after time returning their money in Australia alone. That changed as, as uh, time went on um, and so did the type of movies that were being made. Mad Max being in, in the late 70s being uh, the big change. I met George Miller in Melbourne at uh, a film school, a month-long film school organised by the Australian Union of Students where that was uh, being uh, organised by um, Nigel Bust, uh, one of the independent Melbourne filmmakers, uh, famous for a number of films. Uh, one was called Squizzy Taylor, about the notorious um, criminal in Melbourne. Another was called Come Out Fighting, uh, a boxing movie. But Nigel was the professor or the teacher of this film school. I got, because I knew how to load a 16 millimeter camera, I got a job as uh, a tutor and uh, there were three groups of uh, 10 students and in my group were two guys, Byron Kennedy and George Miller. Byron had won some 8mm competition um, on the Mornington Peninsula and so he got a spot in the film school and George Miller had won a 30 second silent movie competition at the University of New South Wales, so he was there. Anyway, uh, Nigel set us up uh, with uh, each group with one roll of film, two minutes, 45 seconds of black and white film, a hand wound uh, 16 millimeter camera. And the first um, lesson was, you've got one roll of film, you've got to go out and you've got to film a meeting a chase, a confrontation, and a resolution. 
on t in using two minutes 45 of film. So they go out. I didn't go with them. They all went out by themselves. They sorted out who was doing what. In my group, Byron became the cinematographer. George became the director. Anyway, the groups come back. First group, we look at it. It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Second group, doesn't make any sense. And they put on George and Byron's film. And it was like a primer of uh, cinema language, you know. It didn't need any editing except for the uh, stop frames that were overexposed where they'd stopped each shot. It was shot in order. And it was, an absolute, uh, the, it was absolutely defined the grammar of a meeting, a chase, a confrontation, and a resolution. There it was. Yeah. Um, it sounds like the kind of the script for the, the latest Mad Max film as well. <laughs> it was lightning in a bottle. Yeah. You know, I don't know what happened to the film, but uh, George demonstrated that uh, he had an innate ability as a movie director, as a story, movie storyteller. It's a pretty incredible uh, moment in history, I guess, in Australian artistic history or cultural history to be a part of. I mean, the, 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 the cultural history started earlier. Right. Because before film school, we had the Sydney Filmmakers Co-op, which was a cooperative uh, w that um, was registered with the government as a co-op. And all the filmmakers would put their films in it and then we would organise, uh, we would rent them out and we would organise screenings. And we had a cinema that we set up above the, a socialist bookshop at 35 Goulburn Street in Sydney. It was on the third floor. It was completely unlicensed. It was a fire trap, <laughs> uh, but it held 150 people, and we had screenings every Sunday yeah, wow. at 7.30 of new films introduced by the filmmakers that eventually became so popular that we were running seven days a week. So that was, that was where the first films of George, of uh, Gillian Armstrong, of Peter Weir, of Bruce Beresford were shown. We'll be right back with the interview in just a second, friends. But as this year is beginning to wind up, I wanted to ask you a pertinent question. Are you looking to make 2019 a year where you're far more organised? Do you feel like all of your thoughts are kind of um, like circling around your head and you're not really sure what to do with them? You're not really sure how to move forward or kind of organise them? You've tried all the apps, all the planners, all the systems and nothing's really worked. Well, there's this guy out there whose name is Ryder Carroll, and he's come up with this amazing system called the Bullet Journal. The Bullet Journal combines all of the elements of a wish list, a to-do list, and a diary, and I can tell you, it's going to change the way that you organize your life through tracking your past, ordering your present, and planning for your future. The Bullet Journal really helps you to identify what matters and set goals accordingly. So... If you're looking to start 2019 on the right foot, check out this essential guide to tracking your past, organizing your present, and planning for your future. For all the information, hit up bulletjournal.com. Now, let's get back to the interview. I guess to kind of circle back to, to your career, Newsfront won an AFI. Uh, did, did you notice that a lot of doors started to open for you um, in Australia and on a global sense from that? I mean, I know you said that it, um, it, had, it was quite far-reaching in terms of uh, where it was sold to, but did you start to see opportunities open up for you? Yeah, I mean, um, we, in Australia, uh, we, had a, we had a very um, aggressive distribution company that had, um, that originated in Melbourne, that's Village Roadshow, um, and had partnered with Tim Burstall on a number of films um, in the late 60s, of which uh, Stork was the first. It was a, uh, a comedy starring uh, Bruce Spence. Um, and then uh, Graham Blundell starred in a movie called The Adventures of Alvin Purple, also directed by Tim Burstall and distributed by Roadshow and you know Village Roadshow and uh, both of those films were big successes and and Roadshow became the primary distributor of Australian movies they still are really so 
I mean, every everything was happening everywhere. It wasn't like things opened up for me. They opened up for everyone. Everyone was doing it. <laughs> um, Bruce Beresford, for example, was making one and a half films a year. Yeah, wow. During that period, you know, um, he was the most economical of us all, uh, using French method of for directing. You know, he'd shoot what he needed, and only what he needed, and not the American method where you shoot every you shoot the whole scene on close up and wide shot and mid shot. Bruce would only shoot that part of the scene that he th knew he was going to use and no more. Um, so he was very economical. It was a magical era because we could make the films so cheaply and because the audience just couldn't get enough of themselves. What year did you make the move to the States? Well, the uh, move to the States came a lot later. Byron and George came back to Australia flush from selling um, Mad Max and um, they decided that despite all the offers they'd received overseas that they wanted to base themselves back in Australia they bought the Metro Theatre in Orwell Street King's Cross and set up uh, a studio modelled on Francis Ford Coppola's Zotrope where, the, where Coppola's idea had been to bring in a number of writers and directors in a sort of a film collective, set them free to work, and then watch the results. He employed about 10 of us, directors and writers, myself, um, Chris Noonan, who would go on to make Babe with George, um, John Dagan, uh, Margaret Kelly as a writer, just to name a few, and together with um, Terry Hayes, we set out to remake Australian television, starting with uh, a six-part series about the fall of the Whitlam government called The Dismissal that was directed by five different directors that we sold to Rupert Murdoch's Channel 10. And using the same model, we then uh, developed about five or six different miniseries over the uh, ensuing six or eight years. The Kara Breakout, which was the story of uh, the escape by a thousand Japanese prisoners from a prisoner of war camp in the Australian countryside, the real story. Vietnam, which was the story of Australia's misadventure in the Vietnam War, uh, which starred Nicole Kidman, amongst others. Um, that was one of her breakout parts, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, Bangkok Hilton, which was about the imprisonment of some Australians uh, in Thailand for drug smuggling, and so on. And uh, mostly, except for the first one, these were 10-hour miniseries that were screened in one week. Monday was three hours, Tuesday was two hours, Wednesday was two hours, and then the Big Bang finale <laughs> of three hours came on Thursday. It's so the like commitment from the audience was gigantic, Yeah, as well as the exploration of storytelling was uh, humongous because we had to hold our audience through such a commitment, which was um, just an extraordinary filmmaking school because uh, they have got choice when you're watching TV, not as many choices as we have today, naturally. Um, There's only what, maybe three or four had, other choices. You know, there, there was not even SBS at the time. It, I mean, it was virtually yeah, Channel 9, 7, 10, and 2. That was it. There were four choices. Still, you had a choice. <laughs> um, uh, not 400 as you've got now, yeah. which, which is even harder. Uh, but, you know, an extraordinary filmmaking school. While a whole, a whole group of us were making television, George was working with Terry Hayes on the second Mad Max film. And then... 
they decided with the introduction of a new funding model by the federal government, um, a model that was based on tax minimalization, um, they decided to also uh, try and produce features, the first of which was um, John Digan's film. Digan, I think, made three films with Kennedy Miller, one of which also starred uh, Nicole Kidman. And then I came back from America with a novel under my arm that had been given to me by the American uh, director and, and producer Tony Bill, which was a novel called Dead Reckoning, which uh, told the story of, uh, of uh, a couple caught at sea in a conspiracy, and uh, that became Dead Calm. Previously, the film had been um, uh, sort of a quarter shot by Orson Welles off the coast of... Uh, Yugoslavia, off the coast of, uh, of Istria, back in the 1960s. But when Lawrence Harvey, who played the lead role that was in my film, played by Sam Neill, died of cancer, um, Orson, uh, along with a number of projects, had, had, um, had abandoned the film. I told the story to George and, and Byron, and... Uh, oh, wow. Did I tell it to Byron, or was Byron... No, Byron wasn't there anymore. Byron had died tragically in a helicopter crash mm. the year before. It. And, and, and now um, um, Doug Mitchell had stepped up and become George's partner. Anyway, uh, George responded to uh, the idea um, and uh, went out and found the money. That was a film that was shot in 1987 and came out in 1989. And that was a big change because it was, for, I mean, up to that time, I'd been making films that for an Australian audience. I wasn't thinking about anyone outside Parramatta, you know, <laughs> 40 <laughs> miles from where I was sitting. Yeah. Um, um, so what shifted your shifted. perspective? It shifted my perspective because here I was making uh, a genre film, um, a thriller, straight out thriller, rather like Richard Franklin had been making with Tony Ganane out of Melbourne. And, and George sold it to, we made it for about six million, I think he sold it for over 10 million to Warner Brothers, who distributed it around the world. For me, it was a huge game changer because suddenly the phone was ringing off the hook with offers from Hollywood. Yeah, wow. I was 40 years old and I guess ready for change. Despite the government financing of films, trying to, you know, support for film making, uh, trying to get films up in Australia w was hard. It's always been hard. Um, there's never been enough money to go around. And thinking about the possibilities, I couldn't see a certain future. But I knew from having visited Hollywood a few times that um, there there was a pipeline. There there was a voracious appetite for material, for ideas. It's always been the hallmark of Hollywood that they'll take people in from anywhere, whether it's Germany, Korea, Japan, France, Italy, England, Australia, New Zealand, anywhere. If they've got a new way of looking at the world, then they have a valuable commodity, um, which is unique vision, which is what, what we all go to the movies for. And, you know, that constant influx of, uh, of disparate, uh, nationalities and and in our case South Pacific sunglasses you know has been has been the lifeblood of the American movie making machine but um, the other thing that I coveted was a machine that could sell the movies to people that took the uh, the hardship out of making movies 
because for us it had always been a case of okay you've got to make the movie but then you've got to sell it <laughs> you know um, yourself Hollywood machine had already colonized the whole world mm -hmm. convincing them that Hollywood's version of reality was more relevant and certainly a lot more fun than their own <laughs> reality yeah that's the huge uh colonizing effect of the city-state called Los Angeles. So what was it like to kind of step into that from what you'd been used to? Well, it was, uh, <laughs> it was a different form of, of dream in as much as, uh, you know, the, I, I came over and immediately uh, was signed up to do uh, Patriot Games at Paramount. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working with Harrison Ford, yeah. uh, Steve Zalian, although he was an un unknown at the time, you know, he's been employed to rewrite the script. I mean, it's... Uh, You're just like, what the hell four, is this? Four What's weeks after on? we start filming, you know, they bring the first trailer out to the set. <laughs> <laughs> and a week after that, it's on screens all over the world. The trailer, I mean. Yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> it was... It was unreal, really, because it was the height of the studio system. It's not like that anymore, and it was the tail end of that system. But there was, within the parameters that had been set up by the, by the, by the studio, um, there was relative freedom until you fucked up, you know. Um, they let you do what you wanted to do. Nobody told you how to shoot a scene. I mean, ha Harrison was the most interventionalist of anybody that I was working with. The studio just wanted to support the director's vision. I remember we shot one sequence in Patriot Games uh, early in the process. It was an assassination sequence where... Um, an Irish Republican, uh, one Irish Republican faction kills several members of another faction at a farmhouse. And I'd shot the sequence more like a, a music video and Harrison saw it and was uh, aghast. <laughs> <laughs> but the studio stepped in and supported me completely, you know, and settled him down. So the new part of the equation that I was introduced to was uh, the test screening process, which had been a part of the Hollywood filmmaking machine since the 30s. Since just after the end of the silent era, they were taking films out of town, usually as far as Huntington Beach or somewhere within drivable distance of Hollywood, and testing them. So this was nothing new, but what was new was the application of computer-driven information that had been revolution that had been invented by uh, a guy called Joe Farrell uh, from NRG National Research Group, and he had developed a series of questions and that were asked of the audience immediately after they'd seen a movie, and then with the help of a computer, he was able to supposedly diagnose your movie like a doctor would diagnose a sickness. Right. Uh, this movie, the audience are obviously, you know, want this and yeah. they're getting that. At this moment, they should be here and they're asking this, but this is what you're telling them. Mm. Um, it sounds and, like the beginning of the end. Well, yes and no. Uh, but at the time at Paramount, Joe held an enormous sway. He had diagnosed correctly the malaise that was at the heart, or the tail, in fact, of, um, of um, uh, fatal attraction. And he said that, you know, we need to, there needs to be no ambiguity about the morality of this piece, and there needs to be absolute res uh, retribution. So they reshot the ending, and the rest is history. The movie went through the roof. Mm. Um, so... Dr. Joe Farrell was the professor of all, and he 
his questions that he worked out in the in the uh, in the eighties and nineties are still the questions that are asked by the successors to his national research group. The big one now is called Screen Engine. They're asking the same questions. Um, they're a lot more subtle with their own prognosis than Joe ever was, but still the 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 Hollywood is ruled by the test screening. And so is your career as a director and the way in which uh, your film is uh, released and the support that you get from the studio or from the financiers. Because there's a certain magic number. It's about 75 out of 100. If you score above 75, they let you do what you want. If you score below 75, then they try and put Band-Aids all over your movie. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, what was the difference for you like in, in terms of working with someone, you know, people like Harrison Ford, these kind of people who were at the top of the world? Was there, were there any kind of, I guess, inner challenges for you on a confidence level or anything like that? No. Uh, there was no challenge. To, well, I guess there was a challenge to my confidence because I can certainly remember when... I left the studio system and did um, The Quiet American with Michael Caine, how suddenly I was astounded by never having to second guess myself in terms of what I was telling the actors. Because it is true that within the studio system, and the mega tonnage of of acting talent that I was working with, when you're working with people who are at the top of their game, who are as big as they can possibly be, there's only one place for them to go, and that's down. Yeah. Nobody wants to go down. You always want to go up. Well, it was all up for me, but um, but I was aware within the studio system that, you know, one, the system worked for the benefit of the actors. They're in short supply, the genuine A-list actors. They're paid the most. They'll make money even if the film loses money because they all are on gross percentages, meaning they, until recently, got paid a percentage of first dollar gross, every dollar through the box office. They got a piece of whether it was 1% or 20%. So they made money whether the film made money and the studio made money or not. For every one of them, there's about 5,000 uh, uh, directors waiting in the hills of Hollywood for somebody to return their call. Yeah. So within the studio system, you know, the that then, less to a lesser degree now, but then, actors ruled. Yeah. And you were only as viable as your um, currency with actors. If you could attract actors, great. If you couldn't, you were out. So directing was not really directing traffic, but you had to keep in mind the need to um, ameliorate the actor. Right. And I mean, I guess between making um between making those sort of films and when you did make the quiet american you know you were working with not only harrison ford but people like denzel washington and angelina jolie these kind of uh behemoths of cinema history was there any kind of consistency uh in terms of your approach to working with people like this in terms of the way they would respond well to you? um you know it was all summed up to me by uh the great now 90 years old and still a producing producer um, Mace Newfield who produced Hunt for Red October which I didn't direct but then I directed uh, Patriot Games and he which he produced and Clear and Prison Danger which he produced The Saint which he produced on Clear and Prison Danger Harrison and I had a run in over something I forget what it was Mace came to me and said uh, let me just explain how this all works I can finish the film without you. 
but I cannot finish it without Harrison. End of story. Mm. So you better, you better mend your relationship with him. Yeah. Must have been a fairly disempowering moment. <laughs> <laughs> it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But as with Patriot Games, I showed him an early cut of the film. He didn't like it. He wanted to uh, to get an editor to come up to his property in Wyoming. So I said to the studio, I said, look, I want to do a, a, a test screening. And this is how test screenings can actually work to your advantage. I said, let's go to test screening immediately. So we <laughs> went to test screening. It scored through the roof. And there was never any further discussion about uh, <laughs> editors working mm. up in Wyoming. Now that happened again on um, on on Salt. There were arguments about which version of the film was going to be released. I insisted on on test screening my version, which we took to um, Las Vegas. It scored eighty four, which is a magic number. Um, and so the studio said, "Okay, it's the cut's finished." <laughs> Just when it was about to explode into a my cut, his cut, your cut, the actress's cut, the producer's cut. <laughs> yeah, right. So sometimes, sometimes test screenings can be can save you. It sounds like a very kind of, uh, I guess, political and. I mean, it obviously is political, but it seems like it's not necessarily conducive to, you know, telling the best stories. And I suppose well, it's it not can be. To... It all depends because you know every story can be told in ten different ways. Yeah. Um, but as the director, is it not your job to be the, it the is, captain of not, the storytelling? It is, but you're not always right. Right. Um, and um, uh, because, you know, film is so malleable, you've really, but you've really got to, you've really got, you know, I mean, movies have become more and more expensive, but, but what's become even more expensive than making them is selling them. I mean, you need to produce a cut that everyone backs. You, you, I mean, you've got to have the actors on your side because they've got to promote the film. Studio's got to have the confidence um, that they can sell the movie. So, um, you know, those scores, those test scores become really important in uniting everyone. There, there is a hundred different ways of telling a hundred-minute story. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, you know, 99 of them are probably valid. Mm. 99 different ways, you know. I mean, does the close-up come first or the wide shot? Do you cut to this person or that person first? You know, so on and so forth. I mean, Sure. So was there a relief for you when you made The Quiet American in the sense that it was outside of that system? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and, and more particularly... Um, uh, Rabbit Proof Fans, you know, which was uh, the first film outside that system after 10 years in the, in the, in the mouth of the beast. Mm. <laughs> um, you know, suddenly uh, there I was making a film that when I proposed that everyone said, forget it, you'll never raise the money for a film that, uh, with that subject matter. Secondly, even if you make the film, you're never going to get a distributor. And thirdly, if you do get a distributor, no one is going to want to see the movie, just like all the other movies about uh, uh, indigenous stories that have come before. So the pleasure in making that movie was not only returning to Australia, not only working uh, outside the system, um, but it was just proving everyone wrong. That was such a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Was there was there a noticeable change in the Australian film industry from when you'd left? Not not really. Uh, to the same people working, they were just more experienced. But you don't need need that much skill to make movies. It's all about imagination. You only need a little bit of experience, right. <laughs> you know? and the rest is about the story, the acting, and 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 the application of imagination. Did you feel a difference in yourself uh, from, you know, say when you made Newsfront to when you made Rabbit Proof Fence? 
you know, you said that every every film taught you lessons and still continues to. So I guess how much more efficient or confident or whatever did you feel? Well, I think um, what I've realised is the relationship between the um, cinematographer and the uh, and the director is so important. And with time, I've realised that the cinematographers really are the teachers. They're the ones that pass on the how to do it to the director because they do it five times a year. We do it once every five years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, they, they, they've learned from loading film, from being um, uh, focus pullers, from being um, camera operators, and I only realized this recently when I went to a cinematographer's film festival in Poland, Camera Image. So I was forced in looking at films to look at them from the cinematographer's point of view. And I realized how sacred the bond is between a director and a cinematographer. And how throughout my career from the time I was at film school, I was taught by the cinematographer. So in coming back to Australia, <coughs> Um, I brought with me uh, Chris Doyle, one of the great operators and lighting cameramen ever to have come out of Australia. Of course, he's famous for his collaboration with the Hong Kong director Wong Kar Wai um, in a number of films. Chris always operated himself, and he had a he has a unique lighting style. So when I came back to Australia for those two films, I was working also with one of the preeminent independent cinematographers in the world at the time. Did you feel as though there was a different response to you as a, as a filmmaker having gone and worked with the, sort of the top people in the studio system? You know, it's funny, uh, people... I, I've never claimed the title of um, a film by because I think that the words directed by are all that you need to have absolute authority on a movie. And whether you're a beginner or you've made 15 or 16 or 17 films, it's funny how people <laughs> turn to the so-called director and give them enormous uh, latitude. Um, it's how the system is meant to work and it's the only way it can work, for better or for worse. So... No, I didn't, didn't see much difference between people's attitudes towards me when I was making Newsfront or, or, you know, 15 years later when I was making Rabbit Proof Fans. So I guess to kind of fast forward a little bit, um, you know, to start looking at the, the TV era and the way that television sort of changed in the mid-2000s and changed the landscape and you were kind of on the crest of that with the, you know, shows like Revenge... How did you feel, you know, you, you've said a couple of times that the studio system has changed significantly since the early 90s. Did you feel like the TV system was starting to become more like that? Well, the, the, the TV has changed, but I haven't been working a great deal in the areas where it's significantly changed, um, which is the advent of streaming services like uh, Netflix, Hulu. Amazon and so on. Um, almost all the TV work that I've done has been for traditional network television. And as we sit here at the end of 2017, there's never been more opportunity to make uh, groundbreaking drama than there is at the moment in in television all over the world as well as traditional networks we have basic and premium cable like a, like um, uh, Showtime and, and HBO and then we've got these streaming services all of whom have discovered that there's a voracious appetite for scripted drama and an audience who just uh, can't get enough 
of new ways of telling stories and new stories being told. So it really is a golden era at the moment. But I must say that I've not, you know, I've been making uh, um, pilots and, and, and series mainly for traditional networks. Revenge was made for ABC. I've done a lot of work for Fox, um, some for NBC, and only one premium cable show, which was um, Brotherhood for Showtime, a series that starred the Australian actor Jason Clark, first brought into the attention of, of, of America. But it's a, it's, um, it's a great tri- time to be telling stories, film stories. Mm. on film and and through the medium of television and and and, and uh streaming services i mean a, a, a company like um <laughs> netflix you got to you can't believe what it's like it's like grand central station every day <laughs> yeah there's so much coming and going you go into the foyer and there's just 45 to 100 people waiting to go into meetings that are happening here, there, and everywhere, like twelve stations on, at at, uh, at a railway station, or it's <laughs> incredible. You know, I mean, there's just so many people pitching, so many ideas, and so many ideas being commissioned mm. into shows. It's a feeding frenzy, and a consumption frenzy, which is changing the landscape of movie distribution as well because so many people you know are now opting to stay home and watch on their relatively big screen um, instead of their 13 to 20 inch you know 40 inch to 60 inch is now the norm yeah great sound surround sound and people are opting to stay at home and choose from 4,000 possibilities on Netflix <laughs> yeah. rather than go out to the movies. So what would your advice be then to younger or if you were to, if you were starting off now in the film? Oh, same advice I got. Yeah. Anyone can make a movie. Yeah. That's just more true today than it ever was. In my day they could say that because suddenly we had 16 millimeter high speed film tri X and 4X that didn't require an awful lot of lighting but you still have to go out and beat the drum to find an audience nowadays you can connect with 10 million people in a week if you've got the right product through through the internet and you can make a film on your iPhone in fact all you need is an iPhone for everything you can shoot it I mean you can script it shoot it edit it find the music and send it out of your iPhone that's all you need so more than ever it's about an iPhone an idea and courage right that's what you need and there's no excuse there really isn't there never was but while film was something that you had to pick up and carry you could say you know and you had to pay for processing and to buy the film stock, which you no longer have to do. You could argue, you know, that it was expensive or prohibitive. Well, a series of noughts are not prohibitive, you know. <laughs> if you can afford, and even if you can't afford, you can still, you can still use someone else's iPhone. Mm. <laughs> um, but you can do everything, and you can, you can find that audience. I suppose, you know, we kind of started this with the uh, with your Lifetime Achievement Award. I guess when you're presented with something like that, I could imagine it would sort of make you cast your mind back over your career and, and think about how you've arrived at this sort of point. How how do you or how would you have when you began have defined your career as being successful and how would you how has that evolved over the years? What's your definition now? Well, you know, there's um, it's a pretty low bar. Right. Because I grew up in a country that didn't have a film industry where no one could ever say they were going to be a film director because that meant that you should be committed to a lunatic asylum, which we still had plenty of them around to commit you to. 
There was no job called film director. There were no film directors. There was no future to be a film director. There was no future in making films. Um, so having survived for 48 years, I'd say survival is the achievement. Maybe I did some good things along the way, but from where I started, that's an awful big achievement mm. to keep making movies for that long, to keep using film as a means of self-expression. Mm. For an Australian growing up in the 50s and 60s, uh, that was an un un unbelievable expectation, mm. an unattainable dream. I mean, and you've made you know some truly iconic films over the years. Has has that idea evolved, or has it always just remained? You know, just to continue to be able to do this thing that you love. You know, it's a it's an it, it can be if you want to do it on uh, the level that I've been trying to do it. Uh, expensive so you know when it all falls into place you breathe a sigh of relief that said I knew that when I went to Australia to make uh, Rabbit Proof Fence that I was going to make the film no matter what and we started shooting on handy cams on my old Sony handy cam the footage is still in the movie it's the uh, end of the movie where we meet the two survivors of that wonderful trek across the middle of Australia and we would have shot the whole movie on uh, on Handycam if we hadn't have uh, got a yes from uh, Kenneth Branagh, who was asked to play A.O. Neville, the chief protector of Aborigines, and when he fell into place, the financing fell into place too. But we would have done it anyway, and I'd still do it. And I'll be out there with my... <laughs> <laughs> Your with, iPhone? With my iPhone. In the middle of the desert? Wherever, yeah. you know, and because... Uh, you're always waiting in this business for your retirement uh, notice, <laughs> which is when the phone stops ringing and nobody answers the phone. And that's when you know that it's time to get out the iPhone. Yeah, get out the <laughs> phone yourself. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Philip. Thank you for uh, having me in your place in Sydney. I really appreciate you taking the time. And congratulations again on the, uh, on the Lifetime Achievement Award. I do finish all of my conversations with the same question. The question is, what makes you silly? What makes me silly? Uh, silly. Gee, that's uh, a tricky word. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> what makes you silly? What does silly mean? Does it mean crazy? Does it mean mad? Does it mean angry? Does it mean joyful? I mean, what makes me silly, I think, most of all, is when I see an idea, any idea, that um, reinvents something for me. You know, something original whatever it is, when I see original vision, that's when I get really excited and that's when you feel good about being a human and good about being alive and that's that makes me giddy. Yeah. Which I suppose is silly. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Phil. Okay, thank you.